Hello, and welcome to the Dark Ages podcast. Before we get started, please give a listen to this brief message from David Crowther of the History of England podcast. Long story short, David and I messaged a little and agreed to do a cross-promotion on our shows. Actually, I messaged him fanboyed and then got really excited when he responded and annoyed my family a little bit. It was very sad. But then we worked out the promotion thing. I'm David Crowther of the History of England podcast, with regular episodes telling the story of the English and discussing how different generations of historians have interpreted that story. There's all the great trends, events and drama. As the flames were kindled, Latimer cried, Be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England, I shall never be put out. And we hear the voices of the players. Philip II wrote, The Queen, my wife, is dead. I feel a reasonable regret. A man of barely controlled passions, that one. And we also walk the byways of ordinary lives and hear their voices too. Religious debate in parishes could be passionate. A vicar in Wiltshire in 1686 sighed that he came back to his porch to find it shamefully polluted with human excrements. The History of England can be found on a podcatcher near you and at thehistoryofengland.co.uk. If you need further incentive to listen to the History of England, let it be that I enjoy David's writing and voice so much that I have a phase in my editing called decrowthering, where I go through and make sure I haven't accidentally stolen anything from him. I have one other little bit of housekeeping about plans for the future, but we can talk about that at the end. Let's move on to today's episode, which is called Friends and Neighbors. <laughs> all didn't mind my little detour last episode. Some philosophical yeast to leaven the bread of history. This episode will be all political history, specifically diplomacy, the playground of kings. Cassiodorus collected many diplomatic letters in the Verrier, so we know quite a bit about the diplomatic waters in which Theodoric the Great swam. There will be quotes aplenty from Theodoric's primary PR official, which, in addition to just being a useful source for the early 6th century, makes very clear the image that Theodoric was trying to project onto the world. While I am on the subject of sources, briefly, a quick side note. You may remember last time, in passing, I dropped the name of a chronicle called the Anonymous Felicianus, like it was something I said every day. And maybe you wondered, how can something be anonymous and also have a name? Or is Felicianus not a name, and just a weird historical term that I am unfamiliar with? What is going on? And then you finish the dishes or the commute, and were absent-minded and distracted all day, pondering this puzzle that I had cruelly laid in front of you in your innocence. Or maybe you gave it no further thought and carried on with your day because you're a functional adult with a healthy relationship with their podcasts. Either way, the Anonymous Felicianus is a fragmentary chronicle in two sections. The first dealing mainly with Constantine the Great, the second devoted to the reign of Theodoric. It gets its name from its compiler, a French antiquarian named Henri Valois, who put it together with an edition of Ammianus Marcellinus in 1636. Valois was Latinized as Valicius, and there you have the anonymous Valicianus and proof that dorky pen names have a long and proud history. The original chronicle was probably written by at least two different people, and the two sections may not even be related to each other at all, and is surprisingly short, but it does provide a significant chunk of information about Theodoric's time on the throne. I will have reason to refer to it in later episodes, so now you are up to date with that. Theodoric, while setting up his kingdom, had three main things to keep in mind. The first two we've talked about already, the existing Roman administration and aristocracy, and his army. The third, as you may have already guessed from this introduction, were the other kingdoms that were simultaneously creating themselves out of the carcass of the Western Empire around him. Each of these would have to be handled differently, and some delicately, and some not so much. In meeting the challenge, Theodoric had some advantages. The first was that aforementioned Roman administration personified for us by Cassiodorus. Second, regardless of Constantinople's feelings about him at any given moment, Theodoric did have a smidgen of imperial approval clinging to him, and with that came confidence and a certain amount of respect. That respect was then given weight by a well-blooded and fairly formidable army, which he had in his back pocket should it be needed. And lastly, he had a lot of female relatives. 
Most of you know that in times past, if you really wanted an alliance to stick, marriage. Marriage was the thing. Find yourself a son, a daughter, a sister, a cousin, a niece, nephew, yourself if necessary, and get them married to someone appropriate on the other side. Marriage was the glue of international relations, and would be the way dynastic states in Europe did business until the French Revolution, at least. So what did that mean in the specific case of Theodoric? Well, to begin with, he had brought a sister with him to Italy. You might remember me saying that he had two sisters, and if you do, I am impressed and take a star. But his younger sister had died of some kind of illness back in Epirus. His surviving sister was a widow named Amalfrida. And no, we don't know anything about her first husband. She had a daughter, Theodoric's niece, named Amalberga. Theodoric also brought two daughters of his own, Theodogotho and Ariagni. We know nothing about their mother. Sources differ on whether she was a wife or a concubine, but she was certainly out of the picture by the time Theodoric reached Italy. Ariagni you will usually see named in sources as Ostrogotho, probably to distinguish her from Ariadne, the Emperor Zeno's wife, and in order to confuse future podcasters and their listeners. I will be calling her Ariagni, because that's less confusing than having Ostrogotho, Ostrogothic, and Ostrogoths all floating around and meaning different things. And Zeno's wife, well, lovely, I'm sure, will not in any way be relevant to us. I'm sorry about all these names, by the way. Early on in his reign, Theodoric set a good example and got married himself, very shortly after the war with Odoacer was over. He married a Frankish princess named Audafleda. She was the sister of Clovis, king of the Franks, and with her had a third daughter named Amalaswintha, most likely born around 495. Amalaswintha was Theodoric and Audafleda's only child together, and that, of course, obviously, means Theodoric had no sons. Lots and lots of names. I've gotten some feedback that the casting of actors thing that I had been doing was helpful in being able to put faces to names and make them easy to remember. I had stopped because it felt too gimmicky, and I found myself diving into the depths of IMDb to try and find actors with suitable features that didn't seem like a productive use of my time. But if you'd like me to bring back the actors, let me know. Maybe I'll try again here and see what happens for a little bit. We'll go big for starters, and I'm casting Harrison Ford as Theodoric. Theodoric would have been about 46 at the time of this marriage, so imagine Harrison around Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade time, and put a mustache on him. For Autofleda, let's say Rene Russo. The marriage to the Frankish Autofleda is significant. It speaks to the growing prestige and power of the Frankish kingdom, and Clovis himself. It also speaks to an effort to keep Clovis sweet, since he and his father Shelderic had spent most of the last few decades laying about them and snapping up people and territory. We will revisit Clovis in more detail and nuance in future episodes. But from Theodoric's point of view, he would be a problem with a capital P and would require management. Amalfrida, Theodoric's sister, was sent south to marry Thrasimund, the king of the Vandals, uh, Evangeline Lilly and Gerard Butler, for us. Thrasimund was the grandson of the wily guy Seric and had come to the throne in 496. It's difficult to date this marriage, but Herwig Wolfram puts it around 500, so roughly the same time as Theodoric's own marriage. It may have been part of the treaty negotiated after Theodoric had kicked the Vandals out of Sicily. The terms of the marriage emphasized Theodoric's dominance. It was made clear that the marriage agreement consisted of Foetus, a binding agreement of service owed to Theodoric for the duration of Amalfrida's lifetime. As a dowry, Thrasimund was given rule of Masala, at the very western tip of Sicily. Well, that's nice and all, but since Thrasimund had very recently had a claim to all of the island, it was a little bit of rubbing his face in it just a bit. On her arrival in Carthage, Amalfrida was accompanied by an additional cash gift and an elite bodyguard that the sources tell us was comprised of a thousand elite soldiers and five thousand additional men-at-arms. Theodoric billeted these troops on Thrasimund, and their presence might have been to assist in the defense of the Vandal Kingdom, or as an incentive to stay on the Ostrogoth's good side. And it doesn't have to be either or, I guess. Theodogotho, Theodoric's daughter, was married to the king of the Visigoths, Alaric II, and Ariagne was sent to Sigismund, the son of the king of the Burgundians, and finally niece Amalberga was married to King Hermanfried of the Thuringians. Whew. 
Let's start with the Visigoths. Yurik, the aggressive expansionist Visigothic king, had died in 484 and turned power over to his son, Alaric II, played for our purposes by Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Fun fact, Yurik was the first Visigothic king to die a natural death since Alaric I all the way back in 410. The sword of Damocles had hung especially precariously over the Visigothic throne. Alaric II does not get very good press, but it's all in hindsight from what comes later. He had been very helpful to Theodoric in his war against Odoacer, and this marriage, in around 502, to Theodogotho, was probably part of his reward for that help. Theodogotho will be played by Aubrey Plaza, because I have to stop thinking so hard about this and just pick somebody already. Alaric's kingdom continued to be centered on Aquitaine, and included most of the lands of western France between the Loire and the Pyrenees, with a strip of coastline on the Mediterranean, including Narbonne and Barcelona, and nominal control over northern Spain, although the word nominal is very much key there. The kingdom of the Burgundians, meanwhile, was, of all of the successors in the west, probably the most Romanized. Their prince Sigismund was the son of King Gundabad, who you may remember serving as the Magister Militum, who had abandoned the Emperor Glycarius to go and follow his star in the north. Not going to cast Sigismund yet, but Gundabad will be Colin Farrell. The Burgundians had a close relationship with Constantinople, but the Emperor was a long way away, and the Burgundians had to play an increasingly difficult game, as Clovis's power increased and the Burgundians found themselves squeezed between the Frankish rock and the Ostrogothic hard place. Equally conscious of the proximity of Frankish rocks, hmm, was the recipient of the last of the royal relatives, Hermann Fried of the Thuringians. He was married to Theodoric's niece, Amalberga. I'm not going to cast these two either for the moment, because you've got enough on your plates already, and they probably won't come up too much. Famous last words, no doubt. For Clovis, and stay with me on this, I am seeing Peter Stormare. If you've seen Fargo, you'll know the vibe I'm going for here. And if you haven't seen Fargo, go and watch Fargo. I realize I am engaging in presentism by clearly casting Clovis as a villain, but, eh, doing it anyway. You know what? I'm going to make a page on the website where you can look all of these people up, and I'll let you know when it's ready. The Thuringians were one of the two great Germanic confederations living on the German side of the Rhine, beyond the old Roman frontiers. They occupied the Middle Rhine, while the other German conglomeration, the Alamanni, occupied lands along the Upper Rhine, up against Theodoric's Raetia. The Thuringians, Alamanni, and further north, the Saxons, all competed with each other and with the Franks for territory on both sides of the Great River. At the time of Amalberga's marriage, the Thuringia was at or near its greatest strength, but the growing power of the Franks was beginning to tell. All of these marriages probably took place between 500 and 507, though a detailed chronology isn't possible. In fact, the actual events of Theodoric's reign have to be spoken of in very general terms, because none of the sources are very specific. Jordanes skims over the period in a very perfunctory way, presumably because his audience would already be aware of everything. Cassiodorus didn't date his letters, so there's not much help there, and Valisianus is really just a list of events, roughly in order, we assume, but again with no solid dating information other than a few consular appointments. So if these things seem a little woolly, it's not my fault, it's the sources. You may have picked up a theme in all of these marriages, and if you were to put them onto a map, it would become clear immediately. Theodoric was constructing a ring of alliances around the Franks. His own marriage to Autofleta was aimed at the same objective of keeping the Franks under control. Gaul was the most tangled geopolitical knot in the West. To review quickly, in 407, when the Empire disappeared, it was divided into four parts. The Visigoths in the south, up to the Loire, the Burgundians in the southeast along the Rhone, the strange sort of Roman domain of Soissons in the northwest, and the Franks in the northeast and Low Countries and along the Rhine. A generation later, by the time Theodoric had established himself in Italy, Frankish power had expanded enormously under Childeric and his son Clovis. Around 505, Clovis forced the Alamanni to submit to him, which may have prompted the marriage of Hermanfried and Amalberga as part of a defensive agreement for the Thuringians. Clovis also forced the Burgundians into an alliance, 
and was brandishing his wood chipper in the direction of rich Aquitania and the Visigoths. Theodoric has a reputation as a seeker of peace once he was established in Italy, and it's not necessarily undeserved, but it's also clear that that was the image he was consciously seeking to project. The thing about being a keeper of the peace is you have to have enough power and authority to make others back down. Theodoric, by assuming the role of Arbiter of the West, was assuming the functions of an emperor who could control and command the policies of kingdoms around him. Clovis's aggression was a challenge to that position. If Theodoric was unable to defend his ally, Alaric, it would damage his prestige, as well as make the Franks even more uppity and potentially lead to direct conflict with Theodoric. Theodoric's strenuous efforts to prevent war from breaking out between the two are preserved for us by Cassiodorus in the Verrier. He worked to convince Alaric not to take preemptive action, saying, quote, Do not let blind resentment carry you away. Self-restraint is foresight, and a preserver of tribes. Rage, though, only precipitates a crisis. It is only when justice can no longer find a place with one's opponent is it useful to appeal to arms. End quote. He urged Gunn to battle the Burgundians to help him prevent the conflict. Quote, it benefits such mighty kings, meaning Alaric and Clovis, not to seek out regrettable quarrels among themselves with the result of injuring us, too, with their mischances. Therefore, let your fraternity labor with my assistance to restore their concord. End quote. And to Clovis himself, he wrote, quote, What might you think of me if you knew I had ignored your dispute? Let there be no war in which one of you will be defeated and come to grief. I have decided to send my envoys to your excellency, and also sent letters to your brother and my son Alaric, that no foreigner's will may sow quarrels between you. Rather, you should remain at peace, and terminate what quarrels there are by mediations of your friends. You should trust one whom you know rejoices in your advantage, for it is certain that a man who directs another into dangerous courses can be no honest counselor. Theodoric's desire to avoid the looming war is obvious and probably sincere. It's also obvious that he feels that it is his right to get involved. While never actually declaring himself an emperor, Constantinople probably wouldn't wear it, his pretensions were in the open for all to see, and Theodoric came very close to out in the open in a letter he sent to the eastern emperor Anastasius in about 507. You are the healthful defense of the whole world, to which all other rulers rightfully look up with reverence, because they know that there is in you something which is unlike all others. We, above all, who learned in your republic the art of governing Romans with equity. Our royalty is an imitation of yours, modeled on your good purpose, a copy of the only empire, and insofar as we follow you, we excel all other nations." Theodoric's self-appointed leadership of the West extended to culture as well, and here he can get a little bit arrogant, a little patronizing of the less sophisticated rulers around him. It might have been just Cassiodorus, though. I mentioned last time that Boethius had been commissioned to acquire a water clock to be sent as a diplomatic gift. That clock, along with a sundial, was sent to Gundabad the Burgundian, with the accompanying note, quote, Possess in your native country what you once saw in the city of Rome. Under your rule, let Burgundy learn to scrutinize devices of the highest ingenuity and to praise the inventions of the ancients. Let it distinguish the parts of the day by their inventions. The order of life becomes confused if it, this is not truly known. Indeed, it is the habit of beasts to feel the hours by their bellies hunger and be unsure of something obviously granted for human purposes. While the tone is certainly diplomatic, there are little hints, aren't there, of superiority? The line about beasts reminding Gundabad that if you weren't a Roman living under Roman law, you were a barbarian, and no better than the animals. It's all part of the quasi-imperial image. It probably was particularly galling to Gundabad, who enjoyed excellent relations with Constantinople, had received honors from Anastasius, and had been the frickin' magister militum and effective ruler of the empire for a little bit there. Even if Gundabad himself didn't pick up on the insult, and I can't imagine he wouldn't, he certainly had plenty of well-educated Gallo-Romans in his court who would have. Cassiodorus wielded the diplomatic pen on behalf of his king with considerable skill. Not stylistically, his writing is as purple and bloated as it is anywhere else. But in the carefully calculated jab, the message that is conveyed sub rosa. 
For instance, later on in the reign, after 511, it came to Theodoric's attention that Thrasimund, Gerard Butler, had offered support to one of Theodoric's enemies. Theodoric had made it quite clear at the time of Thrasimund's marriage that the agreement between them came with obligations, and not helping Theodoric's enemies certainly qualified as one of those obligations. Whether he raged in private when he found out or not, the tone of his letter to Thrasimund was very much in the I'm not angry, just disappointed vein. Quote, We are sure you cannot have taken counsel in this matter with your wife, who would neither have liked to see her brother injured, nor the fair fame of her husband tarnished by such doubtful intrigues. We send you ambassadors who will speak to you further on the matter. This mention of further information to be coming from ambassadors is pretty standard, by the way. A lot of diplomatic correspondence through the Middle Ages is standardized and sterile, but makes reference to other messages to be conveyed in person by the emissary. We don't know what the other message was in this case, or Thrasimund's reply, but we do have Theodoric's next letter in the series to the Vandal King. You have shown, most prudent of kings, that wise men know how to amend their faults. In the noblest and most kinglike manner you have humbled yourself to confess, and we thank you and praise you, and accept your purgation of yourself from this offense with all our heart. As for the presents, we accept them with our minds, but not with our hands. Let them return to your treasury, that it may be seen it was simply a love of justice and not desire of gain which prompted our complaints. So Theodoric had said, jump, and Thrasimund asked, how high, and then sent on along a little sweetener, which Theodoric refused. The return of diplomatic gifts, while it doesn't seem like much, is another calculated insult, an expression of the kind of high-handedness that probably irritated the bejesus out of most of the rulers that Theodoric corresponded with. But Theodoric had the resources to back his arrogance up. He was not, as they used to say back home, all hat and no cattle, and he proved it in 504 or 5 when he expanded his kingdom at the expense of the Gepids. He already had Dalmatia, as we know, and from there pushed northward in a well-aimed campaign against the Gepid king Tresericus. There seems to have been little contest, which was probably extra difficult for Tresericus, since Theodoric had already killed his father back in 488 on the way to Italy. By the time it was all over, the Ostrogoths had added the old Roman province of Pannonia Secunda to their lands, along with its major city, Sirmium, once an imperial capital. For this, there would be consequences. Anastasius had been willing to tolerate the Gepids holding the territory. They could be controlled and managed, but he was watching Theodoric's continuous rise with mounting concern. And Sirmium had always been in the East's sphere of influence. He sent a force to intervene, mainly Bulgar mercenaries, but Theodoric defeated this army too, or his generals. Theodoric wasn't doing much personal commanding at the time. The Ostrogoths were still a warlike people, whatever their king's pretensions. As relations between Clovis and Alaric continued to deteriorate, Theodoric made it clear that he would not shy away from intervening on the Visigoths' behalf. He more or less ordered Gundabad to stay out of the conflict. Quote, if our kinsmen go bloodily to war while we allow it, our malice will be to blame. For me, you hold every pledge of high affection. The two of us are united. If you do anything wrong on your own account, you sin gravely by causing me sorrow. End quote. To Clovis himself, he was a little less imperious, but equally direct. Quote, I am astonished that your spirit has been so roused by trivial causes that you mean to engage in a most grim conflict. Your courage should not become an unforeseen disaster for your country, since the jealousy of kings over like causes is a great matter and a heavy catastrophe for their people. For all the effort Theodoric exerted trying to maintain peace and the balance of power, in the end it came to nothing. Irritated by Theodoric's capture of Sermium, which came at the end of years of constant renegotiation about the status of Italy in relation to Constantinople, Anastasius made an agreement with Clovis. He launched a series of seaborne raids on the eastern coast of Italy. Thrasimund the Vandal was no help, and while Theodoric was distracted by these, Clovis attacked Alaric. The Franks and Visigoths met at the Battle of Vuil in 507. The Visigoths were defeated and Alaric killed. The Franks surged south, throwing the Visigothic kingdom into chaos and threatening Theodoric's borders. 
Having seen off the Roman raiders, Theodoric was free to turn and face the Frankish threat. His army crossed the Alps in 508 and pushed the Franks and the Burgundians, the water clock had not done the trick, back and reinforced the border fortifications, defeating the Franks outside of the fortress of Carcassonne and stopping them from reaching the Med. But the Franks had captured and worked to keep control over most of Aquitaine. And just like that, Gaul became Francia, and the Visigoths were forced to reestablish themselves in Spain. The strip of land along the coast and into Spain was called Septimania, and centered on the port city of Narbonne, which became the Visigoths' new capital. If Theodoric was disappointed by the collapse of his diplomatic house of cards, it didn't stop him from turning it to his own gain. The Visigothic kingship passed to Alaric's son, Gesalic. Gesalic was either the product of a previous marriage or illegitimate, not the child of Theodoric's daughter, Theodogotha. Gesalic managed to hold things together for a while, but his failure to deal effectively with continuous Burgundian raids on Sept on Septimania, led to the rapid erosion of his support. By 511, he had become unpopular enough to face a coup, maybe orchestrated and certainly supported by, yeah, Theodoric the Great. Gesalic was driven out of the kingdom to seek refuge in Carthage. It was Thrasimund's support for Gesalic that prompted that stern rebuke we read earlier. Eventually, he made his way back to Aquitaine and was killed while attempting to re-enter Spain with an army. Ostensibly, Theodoric now took control of a regency for his grandson, the son of Theodogotha and Alaric. In practice, though, tax revenue was sent directly to the royal treasury at Ravenna, with no effort of separation, along with the land registers and military registers. In spite of the veneer of regency, Theodoric had effectively taken control of the Visigothic kingdom to himself. So in 511, Theodoric had carpeed that diem and more than doubled the size of his realm. Slightly dishonorably, perhaps, but eh. He held the reins of power in Italy, Dalmatia, Pannonia, across the Alps into Austria and Switzerland, and with the addition of the Visigothic lands, the Riviera and most of Spain came into his control, plus he was effectively the overlord of North Africa. It was the largest territory ruled from Italy since the days of Valentinian III. He could, with some justice, claim to have taken a real step toward the revivification of the Roman Empire. Next time, we'll see how everybody else feels about that. Okay. So that last piece of housekeeping I mentioned at the beginning. I've been thinking a lot about how I'm going to manage this thing going forward. I've spent much more time on Theodoric than originally planned, and we're obviously not done yet. The next big narrative topic on the list that I want to do is the Franks, and I can't imagine we'll spend much less time on Clovis than we have on Theodoric. And in the meantime, I promised you interludes on society and cultural kind of things. It's the old fractured narrative problem again. I'm in over my head timeline-wise, is what I'm saying. When I first outlined the show, I was planning to do a century per season, and now saying that out loud, I can only laugh hollowly. Ha <laughs> ha. The short-term plan is to probably take another two episodes to bring down the curtain on Theodoric and his kingdom, no spoilers, and then hopefully I will have been able to pull together some kind of thematic episode. I was thinking about the papacy, but I'm open to suggestions. Then we'll move on to talk about Clovis and the Franks, and just see how long that takes. It means that by the end of the season, if seasons are still even a thing, we might not even be to the middle of the 6th century, but I'm learning to let that go and let the narrative set the pace. Does that sound okay? Normally when I ask, does that sound okay, it's entirely rhetorical and I'm speaking to the void. But in this case, I'm really asking. Let me know how you feel about the pace, the plan, and if you have any brilliant ideas or things you want to hear about. You can get in touch via the contact page on the website, darkagespod.com, email me directly at darkagespod at gmail.com, or I am back on Twitter at Herbert underscore Bushman, where it is very lonely in these strange days of decline. Other kinds of contact are available, mainly the financial kind, via ko-fi.com slash darkagespod, that's K-O-F-I, which is the digital tip jar, where if you want, you can help defray the costs of hosting and research and so on. 
thank you to Nicole, who supported last week. It's absolutely fine if you don't, of course, but if you do, you can have the sense of smug satisfaction that you have become one of my very favorite people in all the land. All right, I think that's everything. Thank you all for listening, and until next time, take care.